computer. All right, everybody, thank you for joining. I think we are getting a critical mass. It's great to see so many of you here. Happy New Year. Please introduce yourselves in the chat and you can uh, um, add your affiliation to your screen name. And if you speak, that's always super helpful. A little bit about us. Uh, the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance uh, works to advance sustainability and resilience across the city of LA through advocacy, sharing of best practices, and community action. This is a little bit about our uh, most active uh, committees. You are welcome to join any and all of these. Please, please get involved. Um, the more the merrier. And we, we usually do have fun. Not always, but usually. A little bit about housekeeping. We are recording, thanks to Glenn. Uh, this will be a very interactive evening, so you can always raise your, you know, raise your electronic hand to participate, or you can do it. I always forget how you do it over the phone, but it's either star six or star nine, and if you're on the phone, you probably know. Um, we have uh, an evaluation uh, for you to complete. I'll put the um, link uh, in the chat. I'll try to remember to put the link in the chat a couple times. And we have some community agreements that we'll ask you to follow and it will probably be particularly important tonight because I know we're going to hit on some hot topics this evening. Uh, and this e evening is a pretty packed agenda. For the most part, we'll be talking with Nancy Matson about transit, housing, and sustainability. We'll also hear from Lindsay Sturman about a very exciting initiative called the Livable Communities Initiative. And we'll hear from Sachi Cooper uh, about the Sepulveda Transit Corridor Project. We'll talk for about two seconds about our bylaws because I think we're all tired of talking about our bylaws. Then we'll hear back a little bit from our committees and programs and anybody after that is welcome to share announcements. And then, as I said, we'll do evaluations. Um, community agreements. If you can, please have your camera on because it is fun to build community uh and it's just it's nice to see everybody's faces please and once again especially for tonight please assume good good, good intent and give people the benefit of the doubt we will be disagreeing with each other tonight so let's keep that in mind we want to be we want to demonstrate respect and appreciation we love the chat i love the chat but we don't want to make sure it's not too tangential uh, we want to make sure we're listening and that we're sharing, you know, that nobody's dominating or that we're all participating. So like if you're talking a lot, maybe you hold back a little or if you haven't talked at all, maybe you challenge yourself and you step up and you do talk. Uh, be as concise as possible and have fun because if we're not having fun, it's really not going to work. Okay. Uh, and I want to try to introduce the uh, board and also Jamie. I see Jamie. So let me introduce the board. Okay, Lorraine, Lorraine, Lorraine is a board member. Do you want to say anything, Lorraine? Hi, everyone. Oh, that's Debbie um, jumping in. <laughs> uh, from Northridge. Hi, How Desi. Tonight? And this is Desi. <laughs> Always fun to see, see, see Desi. Look at that face. <laughs> Uh, I know Ernie is not with us tonight. Uh, Scott is on hiatus, so I don't think he's here. Is Don here? Okay, he might not be here. And Muriel, are you here, Muriel? Okay, so uh, I think we'll have a couple other board members joining us later, I hope. Uh, Jamie Wong, I would, wanted to introduce her before we started. She is our new liaison from city planning. She and I had a really fun conversation uh, sometime this past week, I think. And she said she'd be coming tonight and I'd love for her to say a few words about herself and her role with the NCSA and, and other things she does in her life. Where did you go, Jamie? You jumped in around on my screen. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yes. Okay, hi, Lisa. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, sorry about my camera being off, folks. I'm having connection issues this evening. Evening, but I uh, promise the next time I join the meeting, I'll sh sh turn my camera on at least for a few minutes, you know, so we can get to know each other a little bit better virtually. Um, but yeah, good evening. This is my first um, time attending 
in this meeting. My name is Jamie. Um, I have a long love affair with the city of Los Angeles. I was previously a field deputy and I'm planning deputy for former council member Herb Wesson's office serving the 10th council district. Um, that's when I first got introduced to the neighborhood council system. Um, and then after a few years with the city council, I got to spend last year um, with the LA County Board of Supervisors, specifically with Supervisor Janice Hahn's office, as part of her amazing transportation team. Shout out to Luke Clip, who I believe is also here. He was an amazing team lead and is um, still a great colleague and friend of mine. Um, dare I say a transportation mentor, honestly. Um, I don't know if I ever told him that, but basically he's my mentor for life. But anyways, um, so uh, I was surprised and really happy to see Luke here. And um, I'm also delighted to say I am joining you guys as a community liaison representing the city planning department. Um, it's been one of my, uh, you know, career goals to work for this planning department, believe it or not. I just think they do an amazing job and Los Angeles is just one of the best places to study not only urban planning issues, but sustainability issues in particular. And um, I was really excited to be offered this opportunity to be the liaison for this group and our planning department, uh, because I I do have a personal passion for um, climate action. Um, when I take off my city hat and I'm just Jamie, uh, I like to spend my time putting together climate action projects. Like last year, some really talented graphic designers and I um, put together what we call the Urban Farmers um, Almanac for Angelinos. It's a digital book that we also printed limited copies of and distributed um, as part of a fundraiser effort for two uh, nonprofits in Los Angeles. One was called Community Cookouts and the other is the Shift Our Ways Collective. They just recently started a community garden out in the valley. And they also opened a farm stand a couple months ago um, in part one of the pandemic. I don't know what part we're in of the pandemic, but <laughs> in the early parts. <laughs> So anyways, um, yeah, as you can tell, I have um, personal and professional reasons for uh, wanting to join you guys at this meeting. I'm excited to connect um, this group to whatever you may need from city planning. And I guaranteed Lisa this when we first chatted, but um, I am very responsive. And if I don't know the answer to your question, I will always be honest and let you know hey, I don't know the answer right now, but I will get back to you with an answer. And sometimes the answer may be what you want to hear, and sometimes it may be disappointing. I don't know. Um, that's what I've learned uh, from attending many neighborhood council meetings, but um, you'll always get a response from me is my point. I know that a lot of people get frustrated from government, from the lack of response, and that's something uh, that I try to work on as someone who represents the city of of LA. So yeah, like I said, just really excited to be here, really proud to represent city planning and looking forward to being a familiar uh, rectangle <laughs> in these meetings uh, for the time being. So yeah, happy to be here. And I'm going to leave my email in the chat for you all shortly as well. Thanks, Lisa. Great. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm so excited to have you here and I'm looking forward to developing a closer relationship with planning. So thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm going to hand it over in one moment to Nancy Matson. She is with the uh, Delray Neighborhood Council Green Committee. Uh, she's also with the RAC Transportation and Mobility Committee, and she is the founder of the NCSA Transportation Committee. Uh, so she wears a lot of hats. And she kind of took on a project that I'd been fantasizing about, but not really acting on, and she just kind of did it. Um, and she's going to show what she did tonight. I have been noticing for years, as probably most of us on this call have noticed, that when we talk about transit and housing in LA, it's a very, um, people are very passionate about this, and there's a lot of disagreement, and a lot of different claims are made, and sometimes it can, hard to be, no, it can be hard to know what's true and what isn't true, and I think part of it is that we disagree on so many different pieces. Sometimes we're disagreeing about what we want to happen. Sometimes we're disagreeing about what we think is going to happen. Sometimes we disagree about how we think it should happen. Sometimes we disagree about the current state and what is happening. Uh, and there are just so many different claims made and they're frequently in contradiction with each other. Like certainly they cannot all be true. So Nancy tackled some of this and is going to share what she has learned 
And I know there will be lots of other different opinions. So of course, as always, this is going to be a conversation. And I'm hoping that all of us learn something tonight about each other's perspectives and learn some more facts and that ideally we'll have, this is really very idealistic, but I'm hoping that we'll have a small set of shared facts at the end of this, or at least be more clear on what we do not understand uh, to be facts and what we uh, don't agree on. Okay, I think that's enough for me. I'm gonna hand it over to Nancy. Okay, great. Thanks, Lisa. Let me see if I can bring up my slideshow. Um, so, okay. So just for, for starters, I just want to point out that I am not a housing expert. This is a project that I took on because there were a lot of contentious bills and programs and, uh, you know, and th th the intersection of transit and housing is, is a very significant uh, you know, that's a very significant nexus. And I was working a lot on transit issues and I realized how closely it was intertwined with housing. And, um, and thus I, and, and a lot of these bills that were talked about that were very contentious, it was very hard to get to the bottom of essentially what the actual facts were. And it was hard for me to have an opinion on anything when I actually wasn't completely sure what was going on. And that might be the case with some of you as well. So I feel I did, I read a lot of city documents. I read academic stuff. I read newspaper articles. I read both sides of these bills that I'll talk about. That said, so I'm going to, I'm going to basically promise that what I'm about to tell you is about 92% accurate. And there's probably something that isn't. And if there is something that is flat out wrong, you are free to pipe in and comment at any point, but I'll try to keep it moving. And if you do have a comment, I'll try to, at the end of each section, kind of open it up at that point in case I go on to address your point. Okay, so the two basic facts that we sort of have to agree on to get through this are as follows. One, that we need a very large amount of housing built in the state and the city, in particular, um, affordable housing, and two, that we have a pretty serious problem with climate change and about a third of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the transportation sector. So we have to really rethink how we are getting around the city and to try to promote transit and anything that basically isn't just the default of thinking everybody has to drive around in a 2000 pound vehicle, which they own themselves. So the big program that comes up a lot um, in these discussions is a transit-oriented community, which is a term probably everyone here has heard. But I just want to explain briefly what kind of a, what actually, what the effect has been and what the program entails. So uh, the TOCs are a way to basically so somewhat address both problems of transit and housing in that it provides density bonuses for developers so they can build more units if they comply with the affordable housing component, and we'll get to the chart in a second. And it is very closely tied to transit. So, so basically, the you get the more breaks as a developer, the closer you are to transit. So there's four tiers. One of them is you're right by the train station. And then tier, and, and that's tier four. So that's like you're building a bunch of stuff. It's right by the train station. You can go right to the train station. And then going out from there, it's a very delineated list, but the furthest out is that you're near two very active bus lines. You're within a half a mile. And the brakes are corresponding to how close that you are. And just so you might have asked yourself, well, hey, how much parking? You know, and then in and the other component of it is because you're so close to transit, and again, it's a thing to discourage car use it does relate to parking and you don't have to build as much parking. And in fact, if you build right by the train station, you don't have to build any parking at all. So, um, and what is the comparison point is, I just noted here that typically for every three, you have to build two parking spaces for more than three habitable rooms or one and a half for three habitable rooms or how I'm not, and honestly, I'm not completely sure. I don't wanna argue about like, I can't, and I can't even completely explain that element of it, but just know that the average, that you're you're basically compelled to build at a minimum one parking spot and quite often two. So that is a very considerable change. 
So in case you're wondering the real specifics of it, uh, you can see right here, tier four, again on the right, is the most, uh, the just the, where the changes are the most drastic, where again, you have to, you can build literally no parking whatsoever. And as you can see, but also you're getting, and you can see in all four tiers above, you're getting a very substantial amount of ELI is extremely low income, VL is very low and, you know, and low is low. So you're getting a pretty substantial amount of affordable housing uh, that goes with this. So um, yeah, and here, first time I'll open it up. I wonder, I do have, hopefully I have slides following this to answer these questions, but I'm wondering if anyone wants to pipe in and say arguments that they've heard about against the transit oriented communities. And I'm relying on Lisa to tell me if anyone oh. says anything is. Okay, so uh, <laughs> Joanne, Ji Young, Barbara, and Glenn have, and Andrew have raised their hands. So let's start with Joanne and somebody else uh, on, a, on the phone. I was unmuting. Um, I have um, concerns that um, the people, and this, this comes from, I'll, I'll just preface this, that I've worked four years in putting people on who are not already riders on public transportation as a job um, and under a government grant. So, um, my concern is that the people who would be the transit riders are not the ones who are being accommodated at the transit stops, that um, it should be 100% um, housing, um, affordable housing at the transit stop. And what's happening is that um, expensive housing, if you look at, um, the, the expo stop at Robertson, a lot of expensive housing is being built there. Maybe a percentage of it is affordable, but we're in a city where affordable housing is either a very low percentage or 100%. There's no such thing as 50% affordable housing. So we're either gonna have a really teeny tiny amount, which um, you know doesn't really help much because the other people, um, really aren't transit riders. I mean, they're occasional transit riders, but they're not gonna give up their cars. If anybody can afford a car, especially since COVID, they're gonna have a car. That's, that's actually a statistic that's been established. So I think that one of the um, misguide, misguidances with all of this was not thrusting 100% um, affordable housing with these breaks. And I think it was a gift to the developers who actually prefer building as much as possible um, market rate and would not build a single affordable unit if they could. So that's okay. a comment. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Nancy, do you want me to go through all of them? I mean, however you want to handle, I'm leaving this part to you, Lisa. You do however you want. Like, um, so, you know, I, this is, this is sort of, um, however you want to do it, this was sort of just an opportunity to bring up those issues to see if I will then address them in the okay. slides after. Okay. So maybe we, could keep, maybe we could keep it a little short for this part, though there's going to be plenty of opportunities to say whatever you have to say. Just so okay. you know I'll go through the, let's go through the others then. Uh, Ji Young. So I've done a little bit of, of legal stuff as an attorney on land use, a very small little bit. Um, and in my experience, um, there are exemptions um, to the percentages um, that that um, developers can get. Um, they also, uh, in practice, um, often don't offer up those units to people in the community, especially people who have been displaced and will kind of just steer in the the people that they the kind of people that they want you know um and uh and um uh 
like the 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 parking stuff is an issue it's like why why are you still going to require all that parking when you're when you're close to the transit hubs um and i also agree with the point that it should be like way more affordable housing unit uh, affordable um units and then there's also the issue of affordable not actually being affordable um so yeah all that <laughs> okay thank you thank you jiang barbara hi thank you um just a, a quick list um the toc program is a good start but it needs to be refined uh to address some of the problems uh, it's been already embraced about the percentage of affordable housing. One of the biggest problems whenever land is upzoned and by upzoning basically land near transit, the value of the land increases, which means that the cost of the housing is increased. And this has been a problem and it underlies many of the problems of upzoning. Um, when the land gets more expensive and housing on it gets more expensive, not only is the new housing more expensive, but that has a ripple effect within the communities that are adjacent and the area adjacent, which is not a good thing. Um, when you have programs that have absolutely no ability for communities and neighborhoods to chime in on how to improve those projects, because developers don't always know what's best and how best to interface with the community, that's a real loss. We've, we've been very happy and successful working, for example, with a developer on Westwood Boulevard, who was going to propose a TOC project that ignored the pedestrian oriented district. We're trying to make communities more walkable. And by putting housing on the ground floor of streets that should be vibrant and alive is not a good idea. We can't do a darn thing about that. Um, luxury and market rate housing is not what we need. Um, this doesn't address the needs of workforce housing. Um, one size fits all are not great. Um, what else, what else? Data. Um, the city has done this flying blind. And we have asked at every project that we've ever discussed, can you please put in a monitoring so that we know how the residents in these buildings actually behave? They may behave differently in different parts of the city. If you built something near the expo line and you studied what the behavior is, how many bike parking spaces are used? How many car parking spaces are used? Then we'll be able to plan with a little bit more accuracy. The other thing is we're seeing some really hideous buildings, cheap, nasty, boxy buildings built in our neighborhoods that are going to be around a long time. There should be a way to have some input into what we're getting in our communities because they will create the new character of those communities. And some of it is done, whatever can be done cheap for the developer to put up those units. And that's not necessarily good. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Glenn. Uh, yes, Glenn Bailey. So I, just the, by way of introduction of a, another hat I wear that's not neighbor council related. I've been on the city's bicycle advisory committee for many years. And so, you know, I would love to see fewer cars, less traffic, et cetera, slower and safer speeds and the, and the streets be um, more usable for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, having said that, and also I do ride transit, not so much during COVID. But having said that, I am concerned about a one size fit all or a rule, one rules fits all. So for, for and I'm sorry, I don't have all the new letters memorized, but for the red line subway, the purple line extension, things that are heavy rail and, ha and can accommodate uh, much more ridership, uh, it makes sense to me to, especially around those stations to have more density, um, and try and try these strategies. I I have a concern, and and I you know I'm going to just pick on one one line, but again the rules are the same. The orange line in the valley, which is now I guess the G line, um, it's a busway, and the same rules are there. Before before the pandemic, it was they were it was at capacity during peak hour lines. They had to add more bus. It was still standing room only, packed in like sardines. There is no way that, you know, with the housing that's being built and some of it's in the far end of the, in the valley, the Canoga Park area, people are gonna stay standing 
Uh, and, you know, in those type of conditions, in my opinion, that doesn't seem to be conducive to encouraging transit. And so something that's already overcrowded and then putting more and more transit based development on that justification for a bus line or for even for where you have the two intersecting bus lines. The fact of the matter is, is that people who have options, I mean, really, there's a lot of people who don't have options and they put up with these two hour line bus line rides because they don't have a choice. But people who have a choice, the only way to get them out of the car or not to use the car, or not even to have a car or get rid of their car is to get them there quicker or at least as fast, safe and less expensive and not having to deal with the, the parking. And I that that's my concern in terms of we're, we're having these same rules throughout the whole city for the same types of, for this for the transit even whether it's heavy rail light rail busway or bus lines and that's my concern and the fallacy is we're getting more and more traffic in certain areas making it a less livable city less sustainable and more dangerous for pedestrians and bicyclists thank you okay thank you i know nancy did ask people to to be more succinct i don't know if that's going to work but i'm just going to repeat her request and also if you folks can introduce yourself say what neighborhood council you're affiliated with or something like that that will be helpful as well yeah and maybe we should i mean i don't want to not have people talk but i'm on slide five of a 34 slide thing here so maybe just have a couple more and i mean people will have we can all talk at the end. And if you had something, I mean, I totally appreciate all these comments, however you want to do it, Lisa, but I want to get through these folks, but yeah. I'd like them to be uh, more cognizant okay. of how much time they're taking. And Nancy, if you can stop sharing your screen while we're just chatting, I think that would be helpful too. Thank you. Uh, okay, Andrew. Yes. Uh, hello, Andrew Lewis, uh, Northwestwood Neighborhood Council. Um, what I've heard often, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, with regards to TOCs, and I, I personally don't agree with it, um, is quote unquote that it's a, a giveaway to developers. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Andrew. That was great. Great role model. Uh, okay, 310, whoever you are. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you great. Great. This is Farah Mars. I'm not affiliated with the neighborhood council at this time, but I've, I'm a transit writer. Uh, I am car free and I live in the city of LA and quite a few people have commented already know me. Um, I wanted to speak to a couple things uh, and in particular focus on some things that uh, other people didn't mention. So my top concern is as one lady put it, the increase in the land value that uh, developers uh, when they get these incentives, market rate developers are going to bid up the land value. So to the extent that there are incentives, I prefer that it be for social housing, whether it's for nonprofits or cooperatives or public entities. And that way, we reduce the risk that the housing isn't going to actually be affordable to people who need it. For those who don't know, the LA County Metropolitan Transportation Authority has done studies that show that 72% of its riders are in the extremely low income relative to AMI category. That means they earn 30% or less of the area median income. So if it's quote unquote affordable, but it's only affordable at low income, it's still going to exclude 72% of transit riders. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, the tiers uh, that are provided aren't necessarily grounded in uh, actual lived experience of transit riders. They are kind of legislatively baked in. TOC, the LA TOC program is not the worst, honestly. It's, it's not as bad as some of the state legislation, but for example, state law specifies that a- Okay, sorry, uh, I, need, I need us to be more well, succinct. Well, so if you can- It's really important. Please let me finish my sentence. Please let me finish, I'll stop here. State law has put in writing that a, a frequent high 
value transit line is one that has service every 15 minutes. Ask yourself if you'd give up your car for a bus that might show up every 15 minutes. It is not the same as an Uber that'll show up in four or five minutes. There is a need to tie housing to real transit service, not legislatively specified transit service. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was help very helpful. Thank you. Uh, John and Michelle. Yes, John and Michelle Hales, Northridge South. Um, this one is quick. We are talking about parking and in the condominiums, townhomes, et cetera, when they are given, for example, two parking spaces, which we keep talking about. One of the unique things is that recently in talking to the people that submit the permits, look at them, et cetera, their standard for a parking space is significantly smaller than a standard car out there. So when you say you've got two cars in a parking space or garage, you can't fit two cars in there without taking the mirrors and folding them in, and then you can't get out other than climbing out the window. Secondly, ADUs, there are no parking spaces for that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, iPhone. Hi, this is Yolanda Davis Overstreet. I'm not sure if it's my iPhone that's showing. It is, your, it is indeed your okay. iPhone. Hi, Yolanda. Okay. Hi, how are you? Thank Good. you. Uh, I'm uh, basically calling from the West Adams community area. I'm on the neighborhood council as the acting as the vice president and chair of the public safety committee. And I would say that we are definitely experiencing the, the TOC um, in a rapid on steroids case. I don't believe that uh, TR, TOCs um, are working in our community. I believe that it is a concept and that that concept does um, maybe tackle the climate crisis question. However, it is not, it, is, it aims to tackle it, but it in fact is not because uh, through this process of, of labeling our community a TOC, um, it is not equitable for the low income that live in this community. And also it is not equitable uh, to position and historical black and brown uh, communities that have been deaf disenfranchised for decades in the area of housing and safety uh, in terms of pedestrian safety. So I believe that the TOCs at this point, unfortunately are acting or allowed uh, to encourage rapid gentrification, AKA um, build market rate housing. And, um, and they pretty much overlook and disregard uh, the inequities that still exist in terms of creating affordable housing since uh, they rent line communities such as West Adams and it continues. And so um, basically it's not the answer. And I don't believe that it also is addressing the climate crisis which much education needs to be done in many of our communities because it's bringing more cars and the presence of cars in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Philip, and then we're done. And I, then, we'll, then we'll be done, I think, uh, Nancy. Hi, uh, Philip Armstrong with the uh, Rampart Village Neighborhood Council. And uh, in terms of the, uh, the TOCs, uh, a problem is that the most affordable housing that they ever seem to be able to uh, produce is 10%. And also, there's no accountability for whether the, that I, the 10% the actually gets, you know, rented out as 10%. And the um, HSID has a, a housing registry, but as of, and they were supposed to, and you know, you were supposed to be able to go and search for TOC units on that uh, housing registry, but to my knowledge, that has not been uh, uh, made possible. And so there's no way to know, you know, in other words, like if a building it has 10%, there's no way you can go online and find out whether that 10% that is actually being rented as uh, affordable housing. And then just going back to, we were talking about the, uh, the number of um, affordable units needed and the, uh, the 2021 to 2029 housing element, which the city council just adopted in the last um, month or so, uh, said that we needed uh, 260,000 units of affordable housing 
for people uh, earning less than 120% of, of the area AMI uh, will be needed, but they only anticipate building approximately 51,000 affordable units over the next eight years. And so I think um, you know that's a good figure to use in terms of um, what the need is. Okay, thank you. Nancy? Okay, yeah, let me let me start going back to share my screen. Okay, that was a lot of commentary and information and I appreciate it. And now I have to, wait, sorry, I have to find my way back now. Okay. Uh, okay. So, hold on. Sorry, I just, uh... okay, so um, I cannot possibly address all those comments, of course, but I really appreciate them all. Um, so, but I just will tell you a couple of, a couple of things. It's interesting, all the comments about the, you know, just to revisit now, this is, again, this is a slide from the city planning. I do not know, I have no way of knowing how it was actually executed. It does show that that's required. I don't know if there's been a lot of exemptions. I'd be interested to find out about all that. Um, but uh, this is just a note. So this is actually a slide from City Playing, um, just to show you how popular that the program has been with developers. So it's you'll notice in 2017, it's the orange component here, is that it quickly took off as being you know kind of a dominating program in the city. And part of the reason for that, I know people did say something about, you know, having review of it, local review, but part of the thing that developers like, and I understand in some instances, this might create problems or people might not like it, but is that it is a very streamlined process for them. So again, as people did point out, we do have an enormous amount of housing and in particular affordable housing that does need to be built. So, you know, it is important to try to balance the idea of, you know, putting every single project through a magnifying glass and simply streamlining that process so it gets done. So I just thought I would point that out. And I know that is why, because of that chart that I showed you, it's developers do like it because there are, it's very clear about the distance, about the type of, you know, the type of transit you have to be near, the exact amount of parking that's required, all that is pretty well laid out. And that's why it has, as you can see in the orange has really taken over in popularity. Um, and uh, again, this is just an article to show that you know, since its inception, it has, the program has, and yeah, certainly in no way is anybody, I think, claiming that the transit-oriented communities are going to be the sole provider of any type of housing, much less affordable housing. I guess the measure is, is it producing enough to make it a value? And overall, I mean, from what I've seen, I would say the answer is yes, notwithstanding that there may be, you know, other issues and people raise a lot of good points. So uh, it's built, and this, this article right here is from a year ago, 32,000 units and 7,000 of which are designated affordable. Now, yes, they're not all extremely low income affordable. There's a range of what's affordable and that is tied to, um, you know, I, I'm not sure what, if it's a state standard, I'm sure somebody here probably knows. I know there's someone here from city planning, so they maybe they know. And just one note, this has come up before, I just wanted to note, and this is an aggregated data from city planning for all their programs. So this is not TOC specific, but, the amount of affordable housing that is built through the various programs in LA, if, um, through the city, you can see are somewhat targeted. So, you know, Southeast LA, 47% affordable and down to Porter Ranch. And again, Porter Ranch is not, has nothing to do with TOCs because frankly, there's not really any transit near there that I'm aware of. There is no affordable housing really built through these kind of programs. So that's just a note. Um, and, the other thing, no one actually mentioned this, but I've heard people bring this up, so I did make a slide for it before, that there are instances where a transit-oriented community could potentially knock down existing affordable housing. So I just wanted to note that is, you know, that is a very serious concern, um, but that uh, during my research, I did find out that as of 2019, the last time I could get data, 
um, 56% of transit oriented communities were built on vacant lots or commercial sites. So we do know, at least in those instances, that no housing was displaced because there just simply was no residential housing there. Um, and uh, and then overall, we got like 17 units for every existing lost unit. And But just a note to say that nonetheless, there are absolutely instances, this is kind of a notable one that I found, I'm sure there are others, you know, every program, especially one that's kind of streamlined and doesn't go through a review process. And again, as I pointed out, I'm sure we all know, there are some advantages to having a program do that, you know, in, in that it basically just gets things done more quickly. But in this, this is a case where some people might remember this, there was a series of bungalows, which actually this is a terrible picture of, but this is the picture they had, because I can't actually see the bungalow, I guess that's it. Um, that there were some low income bungalows that were going to be knocked down to create transit oriented communities. So that actually prompted a motion, which was from um, Rue, who of course is now gone, to uh, change the Ellis Act and possibly offer the displaced residents an opportunity of living in that new building at those reduced rates. And for whatever reason, it didn't go through. It certainly seems well worth revisiting and and again, it, you know, any program that you have is not going to work perfect, even if you support it, it's certainly not going to work perfectly in every instance. And if I were living in this bungalow for 878 and my place was getting, you know, knocked down and I didn't have any place to go, I wouldn't be very supportive of the programs either. So there, you know, I, in my opinion, there should be something to, you know, handle these kind of situations. And as far as I know that I can find, there was not, there is not. Um, so another, Lisa pointed out that I guess this comes up and I did go ahead and include this, that some people get upset about transit oriented communities because of tree canopy loss, I guess, and, and probably other programs as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge that when we do do development of any kind, it, you know, the tree canopy loss is very real. We have lost a lot in, especially in particular neighborhoods, and I'm sure as everyone pretty much knows it's not just a visual issue, but also part of climate resiliency and it can lower temperatures in neighborhoods 10 degrees. And of course, if you remove a mature tree and you plant a tiny little tree somewhere else, it's not really equivalent. So I just wanted to acknowledge that fact. So, you know, uh, but, but I would also note that if you do have a more dense environment, it, it can, it is actually the greenest option in some ways because you are building on that same footprint. If you manage to take that same piece of land and put 50 people versus having say like a single family house and you're using up the same piece of land, you can sort of go the route, you know, Singapore is the most extreme case of this where they're, I believe the third most dense city in the world and this is actually their public house. That's their public housing on the left right there. And as you can see, they devoted a lot of space to green space. And in fact, really impressively, Singapore has the biggest, you know, the most tree canopy coverage of any city. And as you can see, LA, I mean, LA, which you think of as being not a very dense city and maybe, you know, which it isn't, is, has about half of what Singapore has. So, you know, density can be very helpful in these ways. And there's a way to think about it and still be very green, so. Um, and as per uh, someone had commented uh, about, there are, there's absolutely no question that most people I know that are very low income who use transit, uh, like a large percentage of them, especially buses versus trains. And I would just further note that um, there's a, a lot of complaints regarding transit oriented communities and other parking stuff that I will address. Um, buildings without parking, you know, don't necessarily note this, but I just want you to know that 12% of LA households do not have cars. So there's a lot of like, oh, people can't get rid of their cars. You know, everybody, you can't live in LA without a car. And without a doubt, people made a lot of excellent points about we, this is the, multi-pronged process where you create structure for the world that you want and you also have to shore up transit no doubt about it but keep in mind that there are some people and look this is probably not by choice i freely acknowledge that who do not have cars so so you know it is nice for people to have an option of living in a place where they don't have to pay basically 
uh, you know, 10 or 15% more or whatever it is for parking that they're not going to use. So, you know, there's not a lot of options available for people like that at this point. So this is just another point about the parking uh, is that even though this, so this is good as we go forward with other programs which give parking breaks to developers because there's a lot of like, oh, they don't have to build any parking, we're gonna have no parking. But the reality is even in instances where the, uh, for the transit oriented communities where they could build, where they had a range of either, as you may recall, building no parking whatsoever for, uh, for the tier that was right by the train station versus having 0.5 parking spaces for the, uh, the furthest out tier, which is by the two bus lines. In all cases, they pretty much didn't go to the wire. So basically even the 100% affordable projects, they still built 0.3 spaces per unit. And overall they developed, they, they built 78% more parking spaces than was absolutely required. So that is a really interesting point as we go forward with other programs where developers may have the option of completely eliminating parking, but they're still responding to market forces. They're gonna to have to rent these places. They're gonna sell these places. And as, you know, as we all know, it's very hard to live in LA without a car. Certainly most people, that is not necessarily something people want, even if that's a future that we're working towards. So in no way, even if you give people the option of building a parking, that, that has not happened. So that's a useful, that's a useful note. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what is going on with housing and transit at the state level. Um, I wanted to just briefly mention this bill, at, you know, so that relates to what I had just mentioned about parking, which was AB 1401. And I'm not sure, I believe it was shot down and is going to probably be reintroduced this year. And, it, and I believe it will actually have a different number because it's the new year. But yeah. it, it's that, right, that's right, Lisa. Yes. But anyway, so just keep an eye out for it and just keep in mind when this comes up again, the note that even when developers are offered the opportunity to not build any parking, they pretty much don't. They pretty much, they will build less, but they will not build none. So there is, this is gonna be reintroduced where there's a bill that would prohibit cities from requiring parking um, if it's a building that's located within half mile of a major public transit stop. So again, that's not currently uh, up, but it probably is going to be returned, is, is coming back, so just now. And you know, once this is from the previous bill and we can all dig into the details when the new bill comes up, but that is pretty laid out and just understand that in these cases, it's very uh, defined what those parameters are and it's not just that you're by, you know, just a regular old bus mm -hmm. in most cases. So it's usually a rail or bus rapid transit, which is very different. There's, and I'm not super familiar with the BRT lines that are in LA, but they are time stops. It's, you know, it's a very, there's a very structural part to it. It's not just a regular old bus. So, but we won't spend a lot of time on that. So, but I will, but I'm, but I'm tell you this to make this point is that, there is always claims about bills undermining other bills. So when AB 1401 came up and it will come up again, again with a different number in it, but in a similar form, all people so, so did not support it based on the idea that in one of the claims that they made was that it would undermine transit oriented communities. And I can see someone has their hand up but I'm just gonna finish this note and then to go to again, then Lisa, you can go to him. So I just because I do have, as you can see, I noted people would have things to say. So I wrote pause for comments <laughs> right, right at the bottom. So I'm ready for you. One second, coming for you in 30 seconds. So, um, so what the claims were that I that I heard at that time was that parking minimums, par parking minimum bills like AB 1401, which again, what it would do is eliminate. It, you would developers would not have to build parking. And again, it doesn't mean they won't build any, but they could theoretically not build any parking in situations where they're very close to transit. So I just wanted to note from the TOCs that, um, that 
in, in addition to that, what really clearly what, what we learned from the transit oriented communities is that, um, that only 20, so you can see right here, only 20% of market rate developers maximized the parking reduction, but they all used the density. So basically they were very attracted. Developers like to build a lot of stuff because the more stuff you build, the more money you make. And I get that not everyone loves these huge buildings, but that's kind of how they are. So because how do we know? Because in these instances, none of them were like, you know what? We could build 50 units here, but we're just gonna go ahead and build three really nice ones. Like that doesn't happen and we all know that. So, so the TOCs will still have that appeal for developers because they're all about the density and they're kind of about the parking, but they're all about the density. Okay, so questions? Lisa, if you wanna take over, I know we have one. I know we have comments. And um, Nancy, can you stop sharing your screen yes. again so we can yes. see each other? Thank you. Uh, Luke. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, Nancy, for this presentation. Hi, everyone, my name's Luke. I'm actually no longer a member of my Los Feliz Neighborhood Council board, but I stay active and involved and was the president of it until a couple of years ago. Um, you know, I, I, I happened to write my master's thesis on the price effects of parking requirements in housing construction. So I, I'm only gonna say a couple things here, but if anyone wants to have a lengthy uh, chat afterward, I'm happy to talk with whomever. Um, I think I would just note a couple things about AB 1401, but about parking requirements more specifically, I mean, LA County, LA County, we have 200 square miles just for parking, just for parking in LA County of 200 square miles. And we, I see people talking about trees. I mean, we have issues with water quality, water runoff. The thing that does the most impact um, to our, our environment is all the ground that we have to pave over to create parking spaces for all of our cars. We have seven parking spaces for every car in LA County, which is like 2000 square feet per car. We don't have nearly that much per resident, right? Like for housing, right? Like we have homeless people living all over our streets and we don't, and we have more than enough space for our cars, but not more than enough space for people to live and have a roof over their heads. And frankly, I think that's a real statement on our values. Um, and so, you know, I, I haven't been super involved with the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance, but I look at an organization like this, we have sustainability in our name and it seems to me like we would really care about not wanting to sort of incentivize something like parking, which is one of the most biggest incentives to getting for people to want to own and operate a car at a time when we're seeing our climate getting worse and worse, at a time when we have more and more people living on the streets, um, when we're having difficulties with water quality and water filtration and our air quality, all of these things, not that parking is the reason for all of them, but I would think we would want to find and, and, and embrace new approaches that might help sort of wean us off of, uh, you know, baking this in for, de for decades and decades to come. Because once you build all this parking, it's there. It's not going anywhere. We're not demolishing any of this parking, right? We keep building and building and building more parking, um, way more than we have even housing. And so I'm, I'm hopeful about something like an AB 1401. I think that is only really scratching the surface because we have been... Uh, we have been enforcing these arbitrary parking requirements for decades. Uh, if anyone is interested, they're based on nothing. They're based on junk science. They're often, here's what that city did. So we'll do that here too. Um, you know, so I, I, I appreciate y'all sharing this with us tonight. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thanks. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Barbara. Thank you. Um... Again, I, I'm not a fan for one size fits all land use planning from Sacramento. Uh, I don't think it recognizes what certain neighborhoods are like. Uh, and the fact that this bill did both a, a dual way of parking in commercial and residential development is very troubling. Medical building is very different from an office building. Um, the needs of those people who use that building not the same as some other uses. And, and again, incentivizing less use of, of driving and traffic is good. Incentivizing transportation is great. But when you take away an incentive for affordable housing, which is what AB 1401 did, developers get 
it, it's almost like the old fashioned Chinese restaurant menu with three you get egg roll. That's what parking was. It was one of those benefits that you could reduce. And in exchange, you had to give affordable housing. So if you take that off the menu and automatically give it away, you are, yes, reducing the cost of that development, but you're not getting anything in exchange. And in fact, creating a disincentive for affordable housing. So I think that's a problem. I really do. Um, there's one other, oh, the other issue is we are in a transition period. Um, it's not very environmentally sound to have a situation as is in Koreatown today, where people spend a half an hour every night circling to find a place to put their car and, you know, breathing fumes, getting crazy, walking blocks from where they left their car. Some people can choose to use transit and have a reasonable choice. We have to acknowledge that there are some Angelinos for whom that is not a reasonable choice based on inaccessibility of transit where they work to get to their workplace or the type of work they do. So I, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I, I just wanted to mention those, thanks. Thank you, um, 310, is that Yolanda? No, I, Yolanda was iPhone. I don't remember who 310 is, sorry. Hi, uh, yes, this is Farah Maris, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to note that I directly asked Assembly Member Laura Friedman, the author of AB 1401, if she would be willing to limit AB 1401 to public and social housing, at least for starters, to give public and nonprofit housing developers a head start to be able to use the benefits of AB 1401 so that they wouldn't get ambushed by rising land values by you know competitive bidding by market rate developers. And she said no. And what she said was, well, look, nonprofit developers use this uh, type of uh, incentive to their benefit in the city of San Diego. But I, I think the flip side of it is, well, if that's the case, then that, that shows that reducing parking requirements you know, first for nonprofit developers could be a good strategy. But if you do it at the same time as you do it as market rate, it, it's going to wreak havoc on a lot of other incentive structures. And it's also going to um, make it more difficult for nonprofit developers to pencil out their affordable housing projects. And I also want to note, again, very briefly, I'll end it here, which is that the legislative definition of a major transit stop is based on what they call two high quality bus lines and high quality is des defined as every 15 minutes. And that, that just isn't high quality because there isn't a reliability. You won't necessarily be able to take that bus in 15 minutes, it might be 20 or 25 minutes. And then how are you going to plan around having that much extra time baked into each connection you make on the bus? I know this because I'm a bus rider. I don't own a car. And I'm saying we should not uh, succumb to the temptation of trying to push as much into the category of transit-oriented development or transit-oriented communities if those locations really aren't high-quality transit stops. Likewise, if it's a Metrolink station and it's a train that shows up every two hours, that really might not be the best place for giving the biggest bonus. I think the bonuses should be focused on where the transit service is so frequent that people are easily able to shift to being car free. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joanne. Yeah, I'm actually in agreement um, with the previous speaker. The elephant in the room really is the transit service. And this is four years of trying to get people to ride it and realizing that to get from where they wanted to go from their home was going to be two hours. And uh, luckily, I was dealing with retired people for the most part uh, who could afford that kind of time and kind of enjoyed not driving. But um, for the typical um, wage earner, um, it's not really, um, there are too many transfer points. 
Um, I happen to live in a transit oriented community kind of before they were called that. And um, that the orange line where I live um, has no parking lot, which means that uh, people who live in the single family homes in this area are not gonna be able to um, access it unless they're really near it like me, um, because the one um, Woodman bus where I live uh, runs once an hour. I mean, <laughs> we'd be happy with 15 minutes, but I can't ask older people if they've just missed the bus when they get off the orange line and they're going home to be out there in the heat waiting an hour to get to their home. So that isn't exactly a TOC problem, but it is a problem with transit ridership, which they're always in this catch 22. Well, we can't put more buses because there isn't the ridership. Well, quite frankly, there isn't the ridership because there aren't enough buses. So, uh, you know, if, if the transfer point is not easy, then people will give up on it. That's it, thanks. Thank you. Uh, is that Yolanda, iPhone? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I would another point I would make in terms of looking at the problem of the TOC and going back and, and reframing, re strategizing um, to make the TOC and its purpose inclusive for all. It really makes me, you know, um, see that the TOC, who did they have in mind when they wrote this? proposal because I don't think that um, low income and our historical black and brown communities were people, human infrastructure that they had in mind. Um, because if we in fact get rid of cars, we also have to get rid of racial profiling. And so that we can catch the bus and ride a bike or walk down a block in our neighborhood without being racially profiled, because that is the very thing that will put us back in our cars, that keeps us in our cars for, in terms of safety. So I think um, we need to be considered, we need to be seen, and also um, that we are able to move and have movement and dig dignity so that we can form a transit-oriented community that in fact actually does address climate change in an equitable, safe way for everyone that lives in each and every one of our communities. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Melanie, and then we'll uh, move back to Nancy. Thanks. Um, I have a lot of stuff to say, but I'm not gonna say a lot of it. I just, <laughs> um, I, I, it behooves all of us to really push hard on more frequent transit service and more lines and more stops. I'll say personally, as someone who doesn't have a car, hasn't for a while now, there were some minor adjustments along the Ventura Boulevard corridor where I live. And at first I was nervous because they got rid of the rapid bus, but they, they increased the frequency of service for the existing lines. They streamlined it. And until there started to be problems with staffing, um, I suddenly, had it, it, it transformed my ability to get places without having to spend a whole lot of time. Most places I could get to even faster than I was getting to when I would use a car, you know, lift or borrowing. And that was, it was a great little glimpse into the kind of future we could have. And I'll, I'll just also say that we realistically, we need half as many cars on the road at a minimum in a short order as we have now, electric or not. And that's going to mean much, 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 much better transit. And it's going to mean things like car sharing. And whether you're working on, you know, at the core, for me, it starts with water and land use and goes out from there. Or if you're working on housing or whatever your issue is, it, it, advocating for transit strongly and supporting those who do and better transit and more pedestrian oriented transit is going to help everything else. We really, really, really have to be being a bit more systems thinking if we're going to make these things work because every what what all the different things people care about on this call here they touch all the different things everybody else cares about on this call here and having these conversations and hearing different viewpoints is super helpful to opening up uh, the lens on that but I'll I think because this is LA 
that one of the things that's going to serve us the most is recognizing that yes, people will and must. Um, we have to have a lot fewer cars. And if there's good robust transit, it'll make it easier on us all. It'll also open up our ability to have more park space, um, not building wild and urban interface or flood zones or on the coast um, and build more housing where there are currently underutilized parking spaces or have car shares where there are underutilized car uh, parking lots, things like that. That's it, sorry, thanks. Bye. Thank you, Melanie. All right, Nancy, the floor is yours. Okay. This is taxing my Zoom abilities to go back and forth, which are unfortunately quite limited, but no, I, I think I got it. Hold on, let me go back. Okay. Yeah, so we're just FYI for, we're about halfway through this thing, sorry. Every time I'm like, where's that play from current slide? Okay, here we go. Um, okay. So now we are going to move to the subject of single family housing. We'll try to get through this pretty quickly. Um, so there is a lot of, I'm sure one of the, actually what sort of prompted this whole research project on my part was some, some bills that people are probably very familiar with here or maybe not regarding single family housing that came up pretty recently that were very contentious. So I'm just gonna kind of get get into that a little bit. And starting off right here, just to point out, this is a slide from 2019 to sort of get our head around what we're really talking about here. So this is a New York Times uh, graph of different cities. And at that time, how much of those cities were zoned for single family housing? And as you can see, LA's pretty much chopping the charts, charts there at 75%. So that's just a note to give you a kind of a sense of how much of LA is, was just completely zoned to have nothing but a single family house on it. And even if the owner wanted to, you I mean, you know, for me, this is probably obvious to a lot of people here, but frankly, until I did this, I really had not given a lot of thought to zoning. It's just not something that I gave a whole lot of thought about. But just as an addendum to this, there is there was an exception in even by 2019 because we did have the ability to build accessory dwelling units. So this isn't completely accurate in that sense, but so just but nonetheless, that's just just a note. That's a substantial amount of the city that could not be developed. And then along came SB nine and ten. So let's just talk about those really quick, which again were. This is actually what prompted me to be like, wait, what does this do? And what does this do? Because people were just very, these became very contentious very quickly. And personally, as a person who I absolutely support more affordable housing and all this kind of stuff, I really had no idea if I even supported these bills because I didn't really understand them. Okay, so just, I'm gonna just, SB10 will just dismiss pretty quickly because SB10, which, made it so that local governments, and by the way, just, I just kind of breezed by there, but in case anybody doesn't know, they passed. Governor Newsom signed them in. They are already in effect. But SB 10, um, which would have, which provided, and Barbara, we'll get to you in a minute, but let me get through the explanation of this because I might address what you're talking about. Um, so, and then you're free to comment. Uh, so uh, SB 10, authorized local governments to develop up to 10 units on a parcel. So the, the, so the thing is, SB 10 has passed, but since LA Council before these, the LA City Council before these bills even uh, passed, when they were still being discussed at the state level, took motions to oppose both bills. So local governments would have to authorize SB 10 to make it That's effective. Sorry, ask you. Mustafa? I'm gonna mute, I gotta mute you or ask you to mute yourself, let's see. Okay, you muted yourself, thank you. Okay, Sorry. so since LA City Council had passed to, just to make it clear at a time when they really didn't have to say anything at all that they opposed both bills and it would require, SB 10 would require them to do something locally. I think we can safely presume they're not gonna do anything. So SB 10 is not gonna affect LA as far as I can tell at this point. So looking at SB 10, SB 10, I mean, sorry, SB 9, SB9 is noted. I think I'm still hearing something. Yeah, okay. I, I, I muted him again. Okay. 
So SB9 um, is known somewhat as the duplex bill, but essentially can allow, will allow up to four units. Uh, if, if you have enough space to subdivide your lot, you can put a duplex, you can subdivide it, you can put another duplex, that's what you can do. So, uh, oh, sorry, I went, did I go? Can I do it on the other slide? Okay, let me, uh, yeah. I actually, I'm just going, I'll go to the slide and I'll go back. So just to be clear, there was a lot of talk about during both SB9 and 10 got sort of lumped in together and are somewhat different. And at this point, our SB9 is pretty well defined. Just to be clear where I wrote, yes, four units maximum. This is the, just to, you know, I went, I read the state bill. There was a LA city council motion, just making that completely clear. Yeah, only four. Yeah, that includes accessory dwelling units. You can't, because there was talk at one point, like you can subdivide it, you can have a duplex or a duplex or, and then it's going to be an accessory dwelling unit. And then it's going to be a junior one. So it's going to be eight. Well, as far as I can tell, uh, the state bill doesn't account for that. This, and again, keep in mind, the LA City Council didn't want this bill to pass anyway. So they're, it's understand, you know, it's not surprising that they're taking a fairly conservative approach and they're not, and they're not expanding it. They're trying to restrict it to the extent that they can. Okay, and now I'm gonna get to, this is one of the issues that came up with SB9 and 10 which is the affordable housing component, which is again, like a really important aspect of all kinds of housing. You, even though if you build housing in general, it's generally, a, you know, I mean, there are issues, but it certainly will relieve some of the price pressure in a general sense, but obviously it's the most effective way to have affordable housing is to just build actual affordable housing. So one of the dings against these bills and I just noted, I think somebody is here from housing is a human right or I saw, or no, no, I'm sorry. It was another housing, somebody is attending. I just noticed somebody's name. Anyway, not from that organization. Anyway, that, um, that there were concerns about there not being any affordable housing set asides from both of these bills, which is true. There never was the state level. They never required it. Now I would say SB 10, that's a little more applicable. Keep in mind SB 10, there was a potential of having 10 units. And as someone noted earlier, I think in one of the comments, there is, yeah, I mean, and again, I'm not, as I said at the beginning, I'm not a housing expert, but I think we can all agree that if you require developers to say put, there's a certain percentage, the reason why they don't require 100% is because a lot of people aren't gonna build housing at that point, right? I mean, that would be the assumption. So, so there's a battle and I don't pretend to be an expert. I leave it to whoever is, there are certain people trying to push it one way. There are certain people trying to push it other way. I don't know what the magic number is, but the ranges that I've seen on projects is something like 10%. And again, I know there was some discussion about it not being affordable enough, but nonetheless, the TOCs on paper are saying that uh, they, their affordable components, which go from extremely low to just regular old affordable, whether or not you consider that affordable, that is like a sort of like a legal, you know, there's a leap, there, there is, it is tied to something, you know, that, that number goes up to like 40%. So that's quite a bit, but and you can see with 10 units, you could potentially say, oh, maybe we'll put one aside or two aside as affordable or whatever people would do. I don't know what that number is. But once you're down to four, I just want to think, and this is four max, and I'm going to get to why most people are not going to even be building four. Um, but most, if so, but let's say you are building four units. Are you going to put these, so are you going to say to your a homeowner that you're going to require 25%, which is, I can't see what other number you would really come up with. Let's say the absolute minimum, if you have two duplexes and one of them is affordable housing, that is 25% of your stock. And this is kind of just a person who is building two duplexes. It's not a huge developer kind of situation. So, however, it gets even more difficult than that because, um, under SB, so these were very contentious bills and there was a lot of fighting to maybe keep up to, you know, so-called large developers from these projects, which kind of worked because now you have, again, a maximum of four units that you can build. And in addition, there is a residency requirement, which was also noted 
in that uh, council file that I mentioned before. So the owner uh, who is building these, this maybe one duplex or maybe two duplex at two duplexes has to reside in one of those units for three years. So that means we now only have three extra units at an absolute max and very likely one unit, which you can't really divide 10, 25% of a duplex and make it affordable. So even though I still hear this being brought up as an issue, and I, again, I'm completely sympathetic to the idea that we need affordable housing and SB 10, I think it's really unfortunate that it's not gonna be dispatched locally because it would have possibly been a vehicle. I don't really see how this would work here. So, and just another note that while it does not have an affordable housing set aside, and I hope you can all kind of see why that is, much like it's sort of like having accessory dwelling units. Like suppose we said ADUs all have to be affordable housing. Do we really think that people would then build those ADUs is the question. If you Are you gonna take out a loan, build your ADU and know that you can never get market rate for it? Will people do that? I would tend to think not. So even though there wasn't an affordable housing set aside, I will just note that they did consider these issues and that it does note that you can't demolish a low or very low income housing under SB9 as part of this process, or actually someplace that's been rented out in the past three years. So, and just, this is a study, this is the only study that I've seen and it was often cited from the Turner Center for Housing Innovation to give you a sense of the scale of SB9. Now, I, I think we, it's, it's pretty obvious that, you know, the, now SB9 went into effect on January 1st, it wasn't like on December 31st last year, every single homeowner went to Home Depot, bought nails, a hammer, and a bunch of planks and was ready to go on January 1st to build their duplex. I think we can agree that even if it were technically possible, it's just, a, you know, plenty of people just want to live in a single family house and obviously have zero interest in building a duplex or a triplex or a fourplex. However, um, this study looks at how many parcels under this new law would be market feasible. And they worked with a company that crunched all the data with Zillow and it was like the cost of construction, what would be the cost, what would be the value of your home that you knocked down versus building the duplex, et cetera. And so they determined that there were um, out of 7.5, this is obviously the state, not the city, 7.5 million parcels in California, that 410,000 of them would be market feasible. So possibly could be developed, again, in some sense, either the duplex, another duplex, or again, ADUs are also in this mix, mix just to be clear. So you can only have four housing units. So whether that's a duplex, a duplex, and plus an ADU, an ADU, however, whatever configuration will fit on your parcel and which whatever you wanna do. But out of those, only 110,000 are newly feasible. So that means that 300,000 of those could have already ex had some development in the form of an ADU and possibly a junior ADU. So it's really only a relatively small percentage of these parcels would be, uh, you know, again, market feasible, which again, and just because somebody, something's market feasible doesn't mean somebody's going to do it. Plenty of people just want to live alone on their lot. And just to see, just to look at this orange bar, which kind of tells the story a little bit. So pre-AB9, that orange bar shows that 80% of uh, of parcels in California couldn't be really developed for anything. I mean, some of them aren't big enough. Some of them, it just doesn't really make any sense, whatever. So under SB9, we basically have gone up 2%. And the other important thing about this chart is you can see that it goes from one unit to four units and that gray color that's the most prominent is the duplex. So even though a lot of people do feel like it's on, I've heard a lot of pushback about this isn't a duplex, they can build a fourplex. Well, in reality, the majority of lots are really only uh, set up to go duplex. And there are some, I'm not saying there, and you can see the blue one is for, could potentially have three types of units and then a very small amount could fit four. And you could sort of see that looking around, that kind of makes sense. Um, 
Oh yeah, and then I just wanted to mention as per our uh, parking discussion that there is a parking component also. We're, we're almost done with the slideshow and we will get to any comments. Um, that there is a parking component, which is also somewhat controversial as all parking components are. So the SB9, you cannot impose, the SB9 says <laughs> you can't impose parking requirements for, for units built under SB9 that are within a block of car sharing, or again, that same term half mile of a high quality transit corridor, which I certainly agree with what people have said. I wish these were a little more high quality, but that is the standard. And just, I just wanted to show you before we go to notes, cause we're almost done with this, um, a couple photos, they're just photos of, oh yeah, oh, sorry. There was one, this is just a note. So, as probably a lot of us know who do work at the neighborhood council level, a lot of people who do show up at neighborhood council events are homeowners. So homeowners are somewhat overrepresented, I would say, at the neighborhood council. But you know, it's, it's important to remember that LA is a city of renters, and there are many more renters than homeowners. And these bills and this sort of development of uh, SB 9 and 10 and other kinds of polls that they do regarding development are quite popular throughout the state. And like, this is one, and they're all like a little different. This one specifically about apartments near transits and jobs and sort of developing them. And you can see it's got 62% approval. And if you look at a lot of these polls, they are very similarly popular. So it's good to note that even though it's just important to note that there are, you know, they are very popular and it's kind of unusual in a poll to see actually a number where something has over 60% of popularity and people have a definite preference for it. So I'm just pointing that out. And in closing, before we go to comments, I see a couple hands up. I will just, I'm gonna show you a picture, a couple pictures of my neighborhood. So I live in Del Rey and, and I bet there's plenty of people in the city who live in neighborhoods just kind of like mine. And so here's a couple of buildings. I have a lot of two-story buildings. They're kind of built in the 70s and eight, you know, probably in 60s and 70s. They're not like super attractive or anything, although I'm sure in like 30 years they'll become super cool and hipstery once a bunch of them are knocked down. But we're not there yet. So at this point, it's not all that, you know, it's not, it's not a super, it's not considered, I would say, like a incredibly attractive neighborhood. I mean, I'm super lucky to live here and I and I love it. But so I just want to point out that when I moved in, this so I, that my favorite thing about my block was this. And so I was like, oh, these are so great. These bungalows are so cute and I love them and I wish I could live in them. And I would love to live in a little bungalow like this someday. And about a year ago, they were all knocked down. And I was very, very sad. And I will tell you, I learned something from that experience. And one of them was, oh, I kind of understand now what, when people get upset about the kind of features in their neighborhood changing and it being feel kind of personally upsetting, I was like, oh, I was like, and my other neighbors felt very similar. Like they were very upset because everyone apparently like loved these little bungalows. And the other thing I thought was like, it's so interesting because this thing that we love, that me and my neighbors were like, it was like aspirational. Like someday could we live in this adorable bungalow is a set of, is a kind of housing that would have been possible say under SB 10 and is something people are fighting tooth and nail to keep out of their neighborhood. So your nightmare is like my dream. <laughs> so, it's really important to just remember that people have very different aesthetic ideas about housing. And also, and the other thing is, you know, and that we might all be able to be a little more flexible about it. And, and when, you, when there is no additional housing in certain parts of the city, like in R1 zones, it means neighborhoods like mine have to absorb all the density and that frankly doesn't seem very fair. And you know, just like homeowners have certain expectations about the way their neighborhoods look, other people do as well. And I just think that's something that's important to consider. So 
Thank you very much. And we can go to comments. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Nancy. That was fantastic. I so appreciate you doing all the work to put that together and sharing uh, so much information. Um, we are tight on time. So we're going to ask for very, very succinct comments and then we will move to Lindsay to talk about the Livable Communities Initiative and then other things before we wrap up. Okay, so I know you folks have a lot to say, but, but please say it quickly or, you know, anyway, Barbara. Oh, there's so much to say. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I always wonder when that 75% number is compared to cities that are relatively flat, whether or not we take into account the fact that LA has a huge amount of hillside land that is all zoned R1 and would not necessarily be appropriate for multifamily housing. So I think that 75% number is a little misleading. As someone who took urban planning courses way back when, when I was in UCLA, I happen to value local planning and land use. And I think it's an important tool to shaping our cities. SB9 and SB10 take away the ability of cities to do planning. A developer can go in and buy a single family house now and knock it down and put in, in cities that accept SB10, 10 units, also adding an ADU and a junior ADU to them. And the jury isn't out on SB9 as to whether ADUs and junior ADUs will be constructed with them. So I think it's a problem because we don't have the ability to focus our infrastructure where the development is being targeted. We need to target it to the commercial corridors and to transit and not have developers put it wherever they want to put it. The other major problem with all of these bills right now is that there is a tremendous influx of billions of dollars being gathered by institutional investors to buy single family homes around the country. By being one of the first states to upzone RR1, we will bring in those institutional investors who intend to buy up our R1 lots and create rental properties to generate Wall Street generated income for investors. And Wall Street dictates what's a rent increase, not what people earn and not what a community needs. That's a huge problem. SB9 does not acknowledge high fire severity zones, nor does it SB10. The language in it is easily skirted and does not require protections for those areas. The other issue with, there are, there are so many issues with it. Um, no affordability Nancy's talked about. Um, I, I won't take up more time. Other people should be able to speak, but we haven't seen small lot subdivisions create affordable housing anywhere in LA. And we need to have more control at the local level for how density is placed. You mentioned the bungalows. Neighborhood character is important. There is no protection for local historical landmarks, only state federal, federal just, uh, acknowledged landmarks. So neighborhood character shouldn't be a dirty word. It should be something that we value and plan with. So okay. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Cheryl. Hi, everybody. I'm I'm new to the Neighborhood Alliance, and I'm president of my neighborhood. Um, oh, I just lost my face. Did, <laughs> you guys can see me, right? We can see you. Yeah. Okay. I'm president of my neighborhood organization, and also I sit on uh, the Hollywood Hills West Neighborhood Council as the environment chair. So I spent a lot of time. Um, wearing my hat as president of neighborhood organization, fighting these bills. I thought they were gonna be a disaster. And after years of dealing with developers in my neighborhood, uh, wearing both my hats on neighborhood council and as uh, neighborhood org, um, dealing with developers, I found that they were very irresponsible and could take whatever they could get and not actually comply with any of the requirements. I mean, just discussing the TOC, I didn't say anything because other people said this. There's no accountability. Nobody checks to see if those TOC units are being used. And in fact, in, in Hollywood, we have a lot of new density along La Brea, and I drive by it at night. All of those units are empty. They don't even put them out to rent. They're completely empty. So um, as far as this uh, duplex bill goes, though, SB9, I think I heard Nancy say she thought that it wouldn't be implemented in L.A. because they voted against that. Did I hear you say that, Nancy? No, no, she did not say that. That's oh, SB10. SB10. Yeah, SB10. 
Yeah, I knew about SB 10, but, and I also don't know about SB 10 because I think individual council members can request SB 10 be applied to their area. I don't know if that's true or not. Though. No, I don't think okay. so. No. Okay, but I did you know, because you didn't touch on this, that in order to build an uh, SB 9 type um, duplex, and again, I think there's debate about how many units would go up. Did you know that you actually have to pay off the entire mortgage on your property before you can add anything onto it? So I think that's outside the ability of most homeowners who might want to do this to their property. Because, you know, most people can't pay off the entire mortgage before they start adding on duplexes. So I think what this does is it just makes this a complete windfall for developers and investors. And in my neighborhood in Hollywood, which I kind of live at the base of Laurel Canyon, um, I'm seeing now ads all the time, developer opportunity, and they're trying to sell houses up in Laurel Canyon and they call it developer opportunity. And they mention the ability to put four to eight units on the property. I'm literally seeing this in ads now. So I just just think this is going to completely corp corporatize, if that's not even a word, um, our, our home ownership and just churn the underlying value of homes. And this is going to make homes unaffordable to people, duplexes unaffordable to people. I think it's complete disaster in the making. So anyway. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I am feeling very anxious. So I am going to push you folks along. Rosalie. Yes, I just wanted to comment, uh, following up on other comments, that in our neighborhood council, which is Harbor Gateway North, we have a section which is in the South LA and Southeast LA community plans. And, and uh, we have R2 zone lots, where in the past there were either single family homes or, or duplexes, but very low scale that had built, been built long ago. And now what's happened is that developers are buying the properties, tearing them down and putting up the mansionized duplexes. And in a lot of cases, they are turning them into boarding houses where every room is subdivided and rented to two people. And they are getting tremendous amounts of rent, which mostly the rents are People have Section 8 vouchers or other kinds of subsidized vouchers. So as other people have pointed out, it's just a real giveaway to developers and LLCs. And it, it totally changes the character of the neighborhood. And it, it has prevented the ability of the residents who uh, were almost entirely African-American or Hispanic to be able to to continue to own properties in those neighborhoods. And the other thing about the, um, the SB9 is, again, it's the affordability and the parking. And um, the other point I wanted to make is in my neighborhood, you know, we're, we have a single family development and then it's surrounded on the major streets by apartment buildings. Those apartment renters do not have adequate housing uh, parking. And so they have to park within our neighborhoods, which creates tremendous amount of tension between the homeowners and the renters. But additionally, as someone mentioned, people have to walk a long way into the neighborhoods to find parking and then walk back to their apartment. And older women are always commenting to me how, you know, how dangerous that feels to them. And it's a real issue. So. Okay, thank you. 310, sorry, I apologize. I forgot your name, but please speak briefly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, first, thanks to Nancy for this presentation. Um, I just want to bring up two things real quick. Number one, um, an alternative vision for how LA could meet its housing shortage is called Boulevards of Opportunity. Um, Move LA did a presentation about this about a year and a half ago. So if you look at movela.org and look up Boulevards of Opportunity, it talks about how concentrating mixed use development on major arterials can provide uh, uh, over 400,000 units in the city of LA, over 800,000 units in the county of LA, which is approximately equal to the current housing shortage. 
Second thing I wanted to mention, since we've been talking about transit so much, I hope you all are aware that tomorrow is the day that Metro intends to resume collecting fares from riders. And there's a big Thank action you. that's being sent by We do need Alliance to be really tight. You can make an announcement at the end about Please that. check Alliance for Community Transit LA. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Glenn. Uh, yeah, Nancy, I would be curious, the um, the courtyard bungalow, uh, what's being put into onto that lot? I'm just curious, and how much it, of it's affordable? It's actually a transit-oriented community. So once I got over my initial like, uh, I'm like, no, I actually think it's, I think it's, I support those. So I, I, I don't know. It's, it's probably, it's the zone with the two buses. So it's the furthest out. So I don't know how much affordable housing is in it. I think that's... That's just, terribly, terribly sad. It, it just it was like the that you know the number of existing units as opposed to the the, the number of future units. Um, I did look it up, and I believe it's going to be a three story. Uh, in, and actually, it's weird. It's been empty. I don't want to drag this out because I know Lisa's. No. Yeah, no, but, just, just the number. Yeah. Just the, the, I don't. I don't know offhand. I okay. Don't. Okay. All right. Thank Ele you. Uh, Glenn, are you done? Yes, you're done. Good. Great, Elizabeth. And I should say, Mindy and Saray, I'm sorry, but I have to, I cannot, we have to move on. So Elizabeth, and then we're gonna move on. Okay, I'll come back to me then. Okay, well then I'm, I'm gonna move because we are, we have 20 minutes left. I apologize, Mindy and Saray, but we- uh, Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, perfect. Um, So I was, note that you know a lot of things that were brought up about sb9 from some of you know I, I thank you for the presentation i just want to note a lot of things that were brought up as concerns with sb9 i think we have to realize are not new concerns they're old concerns um we haven't had local real ability to um control local planning for quite a while now because um the state has said that you cannot stop new development from occurring and they've told cities that so that has made a huge issue with trying to, and you also aren't allowed to require any additional affordable housing than what has already been written in, which is why TOCs have been failing miserably. We already know where all of the new housing and density is going, but the city has not come up with a strategic plan as to how to then allocate proper resources for infrastructure. So SB9 isn't changing anything. We need to start from the beginning and say, where has the density gone? How can we help those neighborhoods? And then as other neighborhoods get built up, then we can go help them. But to focus on the single family homes as if this their issues haven't already been felt by the vast majority of the city or residents in the city, I think is just, uh, it's really single-minded and we need to, to think about other people in our communities. I, I think that's a lovely note to end on. I, I really appreciate that. Um, okay, we're gonna talk about a solution that might make people, I feel like there's a lot of this conversation is stuck in the present without thinking, this is just my opinion, without thinking about how we're going to move to the future. And Lindsay Sturman, who is uh, part of the Bike Talk uh, podcast and who has been really instrumental in getting our transportation committee to move very aggressively on car sharing, is going to talk about an initiative that she has gotten uh, incorporated into the housing element. So, uh, Lindsay, you are up. Thank you. Um, here, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I just have a few slides. and. Um, Nancy, that was amazing, by the way. Thank you. Um, so I, I'll, I'll do a really quick, like, I think I have five minutes, right, Lisa? <laughs> five minutes. Okay. Um, so I'll talk really quickly about this idea that I'd say there's like maybe 50 to 100 of us involved with, and we welcome, we love any help. And it's called the Livable Communities Initiative. And yeah, it, it addresses, it's been such an amazing conversation because I'm um, it's really great to hear what the concerns are. And I think this addresses a lot of them. So I'll, I'm gonna, as I said, we're doing a presentation so I can tell you all about it if you have any questions and wanna hear more. So the basic idea is what if our commercial corridors, and we have hundreds of miles of the, these, as you guys know, instead of looking like this, look like this. And the idea is you make them basically a 50 minute city. 
you add a tree canopy, you slow the cars down, you add safe bike lanes. I'm a huge bike person, as you can imagine. Um, pick streets, um, and we worked really closely with LADOT to pick streets that could work. Um, and obviously all of this is in theory. And um, this close to fast and frequent transit, um, I, and then you add housing, you zone for housing. And a bunch of magical things start to happen because if you live on a, with a safe bike lane, and there's data on this from the Dutch, um, and you live near fast and frequent transit, 60% of those people will leave their car at home. You really don't need a car. And um, as this group has gotten really into peer-to-peer -peer car sharing and things like that, we're trying to imagine parts of LA as just being deeply livable without a car. Um, and that, and then to focus this, it could be in any street and we want it on any street, any community that asks for it, but that we really also focus on the, on our higher opportunity neighborhoods that have not built their fair share of affordable housing. So the idea is to combine gentle density, missing middle. This is not high rise. It's not even mid rise. It's three to five stories, especially if it's next to R1, because people have real concerns and, you know, we want to address those concerns and that you marry it with a complete street, which is the transit, the tree canopy, the walkability. It's Larchmont Boulevard and add housing and make it next to transit. And it could look like this. But the, and we, we have found, we've done, we've talked to thousands of people, um, we've been doing Zooms and people support it, except for you really need to deal with the parking and the congestion. And there are real concerns around upzoning our materials around noise and pollution. I can talk to anyone who's interested in those concerns. Um, but when you do this magical combination, you really address those concerns for the residents who don't want a lot of, they might be fine that, you know, they want affordable housing, but they don't want the cars. So we're really pitching, okay, take the cars out of the equation. And how do you do that? You guys can imagine it's alfresco dining, it's adding, it's, you know, it's slowing the cars down, it's parklets, uh, tree canopy, lots of stores and cafes, you know, Larchmont Boulevard or Abbott Kinney. And as we know, transit needs bikes because the first mile, last mile problem and bikes actually need slow cars. And that's sort of data that's coming out of the Netherlands more recently. And if you slow the cars down, people will bike. And if the cars are going fast, they won't. And that's, um, that's how our brains work actually, um, like how we register fear. Um, so this reverses displacement and it's about, again, building our, our, it's the equitable distribution of affordable housing. The city council actually passed a motion and this, these are just estimates, but this is where we need to build our housing. And so this is um, a map that a bunch of people have imagined and we're taking suggestions, we love suggestions um, and I won't belabor it, but all of these streets sort of have the blessing of LA DOT, for instance, Melrose, this is Melrose, they already had uplift Melrose, they already had a plan to slow the cars down. Um, and this is our entire arena numbers. If we upzoned to three to five stories on this map, we would, that is our 456,000 units of affordable housing that we have to build. And we've gotten suggestions from people, um, this Market Street to the SoFi station in Inglewood, Van Nuys Boulevard um, would be amazing. And then hook it up to, with multiple great Metro. I, you know, and then the sustainability, which is of course the biggest reason um, for the, at least this committee, but one of the biggest reasons to really think about this. This is a tool from UC Berkeley about, you can see GHG reduction. Um, and it's, these are the top 12 things we as Angelinos can do, LA can do. And you can see VMT reduction, which is less driving and urban infill, which is building near um, jobs. And what we're pitching combines them. So this is, you know, we should do everything on this list, right? We should do everything we're all talking about, but this is so much of what we're talking about um, in terms of sustainability. And I will, I'll just end on one pretty picture, just a few other things that this does. And again, there's a lot more details and because it's such a complicated issue, you kind of have to want to solve for all the problems or at least address them and hear people's concerns. Um, but it creates political will <laughs> for beautiful uh, light rail, grassy medians, which I'm obsessed with, and just really transforming our communities into sustainable places. And um, one last thing I will talk about is that we're imagining it as having tiers of 30 to 50 to 100% affordable housing. And I can talk about how that pencils out um, if anyone wants a sidebar with me. Um, yeah, and that is my presentation. Uh, thank you. That was fantastic. And I'm hoping that Lindsay can either come back here and we'll give her a lot more time. She has presented in the Transportation Committee, so maybe she can bring it back there also for a more in-depth uh, conversation. Um, okay, and now we are going to go to Sachi Cooper, who's with the Northwestwood Neighborhood Council. 
to talk about the Sepulveda Transit Corridor Project. Uh, this is something that we might end up voting on, and if we vote on it, we will be doing it via email remotely because we must weigh in if we are going to weigh in before our next meeting. So stay tuned. Uh, Sachi, you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sachi. I am from the Northwestwood Neighborhood Council, as stated. Oh. I think my screen froze, but I think we're back. Great. Um, and yeah, I'm here uh, as a member of the STC for All Coalition, which stands for the Sepulveda Transit Quarter for All Coalition. Um, and just to kind of give an overview of the project, if you are kind of unaware or haven't heard of it yet, uh, the Sepulveda Transit Quarter is a project that will eventually link the San Fernando Valley to the west side and eventually all the way down to LAX via a high speed, high capacity rail line. Uh, Metro is currently in its scoping period of the process as part of its CEQA review. And so uh, as Lisa kind of hinted at, this review period is ending um, in just over a month. So acting on this is really critical if we want to make our voices heard on the project. Uh, just to go a little bit more into depth into the project, uh, you know, a, a smart uh, Sepulveda Transit Corridor line will allow users to get from the valley to the west side in under 20 minutes, which is really impressive, um, much faster than taking the 405, especially in peak hours of traffic. Uh, there are currently six alternative alignments uh, under consideration. And what's unique about this project is that some of these alignments are from a private developer. They're being proposed as part of a public-private partnership, P3 um, project. And so what we're, what we're at now with the lines, there's a bunch of maps which kind of are a lot to take in at first glance, but we have this handy chart here uh, which kind of compares the different options. So you can see that options one through three are monorail alignments. Uh, option three does have a portion that goes underground. Um, and then options four through six are heavy rail alignments with um, some above ground, but mostly underground um, stops. And then only options three through six actually have a stop at UCLA and also a connection to the Westwood Purple Line. And so part of what STC for All is really advocating for um, is a UCLA and a Westwood Village Purple Line uh, station because by Metro's own projections, a UCLA stop is predicted to be the busiest non-transfer stop in the entire Metro rail system. There's a variety of different entities that uh, really need access to this kind of direct station. Um, and so, I can go a lot more into it. This I'm using a website, stcforall.org, that will be launched tomorrow. So you will all have lots of time to peruse um, at your leisure. But there's pages we have here on access and equity. Um, there's pages here about how to get involved, how to give public comment, all of that, lots more resources. Um, but for now, what we're asking is for the NCSA to kind of join on as a coalition partner. You can see just a few of the partners listed here. Um, and it's really important that we all make our voices heard on this. So hopefully you all can join us and thank you for giving me the time to present. Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, I know we're moving quickly. I know some people have their hands raised. I'm going to try to get through some other stuff. And then if we have time at the end, we can go back to Mindy or Saray or people who want to talk about Sat with Sachi or Lindsay we're talking about. Uh, but I just want to make sure we get through some stuff first. Um, bylaws, I um, sent any, everybody who's a representative a link to the bylaws. We did make one. Um, we've been working on them kind of slowly because we haven't had all, our, all of our board members together often enough. But uh, I did confer with um, some folks in committees. We did, we've just been discussing them in committees. And we've made one uh, other change, which is to limit the power of the board, because some people were concerned that the board could um, sort of uh, sway a vote more than people were comfortable. So we've made that change. You're welcome to look at them. I'm, we're hoping to wrap them up. We've been hoping to wrap them up for six months. We're still hoping to wrap them up. If you want to comment or if you want to say something about them, 
uh, let me know and I'll give you commenting or editing privileges and just then just do what you like. I mean, we're so we're trying to not, I don't think we need the conversations in this kind of forum as much. And I think we're all probably as tired of those conversations as I am. So uh, check them out if you have, and if you have, have any thoughts that you wanna add to them, let me know. Okay, uh, now we're going to go to our committee and uh, program updates. Uh, I will uh, start if I can, and this has happened before that I can't access. Uh, bear with me, this is so hard when I'm on Zoom. Um, oh, this is a link. Okay, that's fine. I forgot I was in a link. I'll, I'll try to, okay. I, anyway, I didn't mean to pull up this version, but so I'll leave it in presentation in this mode because I don't know how to, oh, slideshow. Let me do that here. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I thought I was pulling up a PowerPoint. Um, so our advocacy committee, we did not meet this uh, month because it was uh, Sunday the 2nd and everybody was still in holiday mode. So I just wanted to follow up on some of the things we'd been discussing before. Uh, this is a list of the folks who have submitted uh, CISs on the Fire District 1 expansion. So thank you, thank you, thank you if you have done it. If you haven't, please do. Uh, this is, we're starting to get a critical mass, but this has been like six months in the works and I would be, be much more comfortable if we had a few more CISs on that. So please do that if you can. Uh, the LA Zoo expansion, these are the CISs we have. Thank you for those. Uh, Mulholland Scenic Parkway specific plan, we only got a couple, but I'm not worried about it because city council unanimously passed this. So I feel better about that one. Uh, as Nancy mentioned, SB9 is um, a, a, a sort of a, what I would call it an operationalizing of it. Uh, there was a council file, file for it. I don't know that we need to weigh on in on it, but we'll probably discuss it as an advocacy uh, committee in case you are interested. Uh, and as always, you can go to our website, uh, ncsa.la, and then go to submit a CIS to see the things that we are asking you to submit CISs on. Uh, cool blocks. So many of you have been so supportive of this program, and so many of you are actually going to be cool block leaders soon. So thank you for that. Um, we are having our launch event this Thursday from 6 to 7 p.m. And we would love, love, love to see all of you there. I think it's going to be fun. We're going to be hearing from a range of city leaders. And um, as I said, so many of you have been involved. We've got design team chairs. We've had folks who are going to be on the design teams, people who are going to be cool block leaders. I think it's going to be great. OK, uh, Dan, Energy Committee. Why, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. So uh, just a reminder, as always, we meet at 7 p.m. on the third Tuesday. Um, please uh, go to ncsa.la slash energy to read um, what we're up to and uh, to find out how to join. Um, one of the things we discussed last month was there's a new uh, um, campaign called Switches On. The Switch is On at www.switchison.org. There's lots of resources for how you can decarbonize your home or um, how you can uh, help a contractor figure out how to decarbonize your home. And uh, the other thing is we're very excited about cool blocks coming up. I think that um, people really do want to have a way to participate in the energy transition. And cool blocks is a good way to do it. Um, that is all. Let's move on. Thank you, Dan. That was great. Muriel. Muriel is on our board and she's the chair of our transportation committee. Good evening, everybody. Um, so we recently had a meeting on Thursday on the 6th around 7 p.m. Um, please come. Those were where that was where I got to see the sneak preview of like the two presentations that you got to see earlier. Um, so at our last meeting, we did a talk about the Sepulveda Pass at Sachin also. Um, talked about as well. Um, we had another UCLA Luskin project update, and we are on our way towards um, updating the committee charter, charter. It's still a work in progress. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Muriel. And Joanne, trees. 
Yes, uh, the Trees Committee, which meets bi-monthly, um, but didn't meet uh, in November and December because we meet at the end of the month uh, due to the holidays. We didn't meet, but uh, we are meeting January 29th. And we have two topics. Um, one is making sure a tree has the right upbringing and whose responsibility is it for a right of way tree? That's all one topic. Um, a lot of times um, we expect more from urban forestry than they actually provide. So this will be an opportunity to learn um, about the sapling care and uh, what uh, the actual needs are. Uh, and of course it's species um, uh, determined, but uh, there are some general um, ideas that we can talk about. And um, the second is um, every neighborhood council gets a notification in their mailbox, whether you know this or not, of any demolition that is happening in your area. And um, I happen to pick up the mail for my neighborhood council, so I see these first. And I'm on the Planning and Land Use Committee. Um, and we're finding that all these lots, similar to the one in the presentation tonight, they, they get clear cut. And um, this is not the case in other cities. So um, we are um, working uh, to find a way with building and safety um, and also the planning department, which is actually further along. Um, but we are trying to see what we can do for building around trees. Uh, the Community Forest Advisory Committee has a building around trees subcommittee. And um, we are interested in how this can be uh, possible to help our tree canopy, which is getting devastated um, as we speak. So um, we can't plant fast enough to keep up with the decline of the um, mature trees. So there are things that we think we can do. We actually are starting to get heard at the planning department um, and um, uh, the Board of Public Works is actually working with the planning department to get a tree report first um, before uh, anything happens at the planning department. And this is in the works and now we're, we're facing building and safety since so many projects are ministerial nowadays. And that's it, please come. If you want to come um, uh, email me at trees at ncsa.la and I will send you the agenda closer to the uh, meeting time, hold the date for now and uh, the Zoom link will be on the agenda. Um, we will likely have a speaker for the first one. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. For announcements, super briefly, please, if you can, come Thursday. It'd be great to have you. Uh, also, I think our next meeting will be February 27th. I can't remember. There are a couple of conflicts the uh, regular weekend. Um, and I think it will be on organics. In December, you folks, uh, many, many, many of you said that was your highest priority for 2022. So, I've been in touch with LA Sanitation and I'm hoping that they'll be able to join us uh, February for a deeper dive into what's going on with that because there is a lot going on. Uh, does anybody else have announcements? Charles, go for it. And then, uh, and if we have time, we'll circle back to other people or if you wanna stay on the call after 8.30 and if Mindy and Saray and others are able to stay on, we can hear from folks who, um, who I had to cut off. Really quickly, uh, January 30th at 4 p.m., that's a Sunday, the Palms Neighborhood Council is hosting a seminar on installing EV chargers in small multifamily residential buildings. These older buildings that are up like five to 25 units, and they pose a lot of challenges to make them compatible with EV charging. And uh, I'm going to be the host for it along with uh, some other people, possibly. And I uh, just sent in the chat room a link to uh, supporting documents on it and a link to the Google reservations things. Thank you, Lisa, too, because it's all kind of happened because of her. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Glenn, did you have an announcement? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, some of you who are uh, you know, in, uh, neighborhood council board members or probably others, 
uh, may have gotten a, a recent communication about the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment budget request for next fiscal year. And the general manager is going around to some of the alliances. I don't know if N NCSA was contacted or not. No. Nope. Um, okay. So um, uh, one of the alliances, uh, or so called, fits in that category is the Neighbor Council Budget Advocates. And we said, well, instead of coming to the board, why don't we open it up to anyone who hasn't otherwise uh, uh, had this conversation at the alliances? So we're doing a town hall uh, featuring Raquel Beltran, the general manager of the Department of Neighbor Empowerment with their budget. They've actually got two budget requests. It's, they're significant. And um, in terms of how they would impact or help um, neighbor councils, uh, we have that scheduled for Saturday. January 29th at 10 a.m. Um, I think the presentation would be in, uh, and Q&A is a, an, an hour. It may extend a little bit more depending on the number of questions. So Saturday, January 29th, 10 a.m. Um, I'll put the website in the in the chat, but just for those on the phone, okay. it's www.budgetadvocates.org and you're all invited. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Barbara, did you have an announcement? Yeah, I wanted to remind people if they didn't know that you and Stacy Schur are doing a presentation on the Developer Sustainable Guidelines Wednesday night at Palms Neighborhood Council Land Use Committee. So if you can fill in more details, that's good. And then also um, there is in circulation our Neighborhood Voices petition trying to qualify for the November 22 ballot, which would return local land use planning to those cities that wish to do it uh and and kind of balance this this current uh effort to do planning from afar with one size fits all planning and just to spice things up barbara told us about that uh web effort in the uh transportation committee the other night so i looked it up and found out that it's sponsored by the aids healthcare foundation which is suing the city to i'm going to say this maybe a little harshly to slow down development uh it's not fun it's not sponsored by them, but they are a major donor at this point because it's a grassroots record ref effort and there isn't much money in there from big groups. So they are giving money, but Mayor Bill Brand of Redondo Beach was the initial author and instigator. And there's a bipartisan, tripartisan committee of local city officials that are really the sponsors. Okay, yeah, maybe we just argue about the semantics of sponsors. It's funded okay. by, in part, at least by the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Uh, but thank you. Okay, if announcements are done, one great conversation. Thank you, folks. I'm happy to stay on in case people who I had to cut off want to keep talking. If folks want to stay on, I'm happy to stay and others might be as well. Thank you, folks. I think this was a difficult but good and important conversation. And a uh, happy, happy new year and all of this to be continued, <clears throat> right? There's a lot of work to do, as we know. Uh, let's go to Mindy if you're still here. I'm still here and I was going to be very brief since it was a long discussion and, and Barbara was very, very uh, succinct in her comments also and, and I agreed with everything that Barbara had to say so uh, rather than being repetitive I was just going to say that, you know, I'm, I'm in um, the Bel Air Beverly uh, Crest Neighborhood Council and we are a hillside community. So we have a kind of very specific, uh, um, you know, uh, concerns, and we are in a very high fire uh, severity zone. So in terms of SB9, we, we have those concerns and the concerns of open space and protected trees. And so um, we feel that SB9 does not um, look at those concerns. And, um, and I also don't feel that it really looks at the concern of affordable housing, which is what it's really supposed to do. So, um, so like I said, Barbara really talked about it. So I don't wanna repeat everything that she said. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, Saray, are you still with us? We might've lost you. Oh, no, I see you, you're yeah. there, hi. Yes, hey, Lisa, great meeting. Thanks for having us. Um, I just uh, wanted to kind of add um, to uh, there was one guest who who was mentioning, um, well, you know, I'm very passionate about uh, green space within the communities. Um, 
uh, and, and I believe they were related to parking, if I'm not mistaken, um, what they said. But in any event, I just wanted to try to coalesce um, or find the time to coalesce some neighborhood council members to uh, possibly lobby that issue within their committees are, of course, uh, neighborhood councils. So we can um, put, you know, create more advocacy, obviously, but um, shed light with the uh, organizations such as uh, uh, the parks, the County of LA parks and um, uh, the natural uh, uh, forest service. Th that's what, that's what she said. She mentioned how, uh, how they don't have, I think it was one of the, uh, one of your committee members, she was saying how they don't have enough, how they don't provide enough resources to take those kind of inventories. And of course, um, blueprint the, the green space. So I, I, I say to myself, maybe we can, um, and of course with the cool blocks, that's obviously where that conversation can come into play. But um, I, I think uh, the, the neighborhood councils can, can um, you know, be a little bit more vocal uh, with these issues in connection to affordable housing and um, safety school zones, basically. Safety with safety okay. within the safety within the school zones, including habitable environments. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. That was a lot. We can talk offline, or you're welcome to join, and or you're welcome to join any of our committees. Of course, if you think one might be appropriate to move what you're thinking about forward. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, have we lost Virginia? She was next on my list. I think we might have lost her. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I was really interested in the whole, um, oh, I see the, the, the second, the presentation about um, the corridors. Um, and I think I was happy to see that, that, the, that the map that was shown included Melrose further east. But I, I do think that whenever we're thinking about kind of corridors and what corridors need what, we need to consider what corridors are not even sufficient to federal standards now before we continue to enhance other corridors. I mean, mm -hmm. I know for me, it was very, and for a lot of people in my neighborhood, very frustrating to hear Metro, you know, chipping in to help out to get all these grants for Melrose you know, on the Western portion when Melrose on the Eastern portion is not ADA compliant at all. And you can't even get a baby carriage down the street. You have to walk in the middle of the street. I hear you. a very dangerous street. And so, you know, I, I think we need to keep in mind, I mean, our bus stops don't have benches. We don't have any shade, anything like that. And so it's, well, you know, reminding me, there's that capital improvement uh, CIS. Uh, maybe we got to, I mean, that one I don't think has moved for a while. Maybe I mean, I don't mean CIS, I mean council file. The, the capital expenditures uh, issue about equitable expenditures in different neighborhoods. Maybe we need to go back and, I mean, I know it hasn't moved, but I don't know what's going on with it. Well, I think it was the, the, the presentation that, uh, was it Mindy who did it? Lindsay. Sorry. Lindsay, got it, yeah. That's what I was thinking of. Got it, I don't know if she's still on, uh, but you uh, can email her or come to our transportation committee probably to continue discussing. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Nish. Yeah, thanks Lisa for organizing this meeting. Um, I was, uh, you know, my question was for, actually for, for Lindsay. I was wondering, well, actually, I was wondering if it'd be possible for you to send all of us uh, the presentations from tonight. Um, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, <clears throat> and I was also wondering with regards to Lindsay's uh, presentation, like I know she's she's mentioning that they that they are working or that livable what's their group called uh, the Livable Communities Initiative. Right. Like if the, she mentioned that they're working uh, in conjunction with LADOT. 
And if there is some sort of resolution that was being brought before either the city council or the uh, transportation committee, if uh, if so, like if there's something that you know the different neighborhood councils could write a CIS in support of. Uh, um, I don't think she's here, but I'll tell you what I know uh, or what I understand to be true. Um, it has been incorporated into the housing element, but the housing element doesn't mean things happen. It's just a document. So what they're actually, what I think they want us to do as the NCSA is to become a coalition member. Uh, and I'm not sure what they're thinking is beyond that. And, but I, they're really trying, I think to, you know, she's doing a ton of outreach and obviously they've done a lot of work and they've got, I think a very, very impressive vision um, but there's no council file at the moment, and I don't know if there will be one. But those are good questions. Like I don't, so I don't know exactly what her next steps are. But the first, you next step I mean, so she, she, so she showed that map that identified the different corridors. Has that been in, included in the housing element itself? Those individual corridors. Great question. I don't know, and I wish she were here. I don't know. Great question. All right. Thanks. Uh, so we'll have to we'll have to bring her back from with more time. For sure. Uh, okay, 310, I'm sorry, I, I still, yeah, I don't know your name, but please go ahead. Thanks, I, I wanted to uh, comment on something that Sachi brought up, uh, which is the STC for All website. Um, I've been working with Andrew Lewis from Northwestwood Neighborhood Council on this issue. Uh, one thing that I'd like to bring to everyone's attention is that a number of groups are trying to ask Metro to include within the scope of its environmental study, a lot of the things that we were discussing tonight about uh, protecting renters at risk of displacement. A large portion of the rental stock along this corridor, particularly in the San Fernando Valley, consists of apartment buildings built after 1978 and thus are not protected under the LA Rent Stabilization Ordinance. So there are ideas being discussed like asking uh, Metro to identify uh, um, uh, at risk, tenants at risk of displacement due to rising rents um, um, and uh, also to identify mitigation measures that it could implement or that other agencies like the city of LA could implement in partnership with it, like a tenant opportunity purchase act or a rental registry, et cetera. So uh, definitely would encourage people to check out the website. Thank you. Oh, and uh, sorry, and Metro is holding a scoping meeting on the environmental study for the Sepulveda Transit Corridor project this Tuesday at 6 p.m. And there's information on that as well. Oh, thank you. I didn't know that. And one thing I meant to mention, you just reminded me is, you know, I don't know if we will try to take a position on this as the NCSA or not, but at the least, we do hope you can submit uh, your own comments uh, through the website. And comments are due February 11th. And I can, I think I can put a, a link in the um, chat in case that's helpful. Um, and Sachi, are you, I think you, we lost you too. Is that correct? Yes, I think we did. Okay. Um, any last, oh, I'll put this in the chat and then any, oh, Jian, go ahead. Um, I put in the chat, um, uh, information about state bills that are pending and in January uh, is when pending uh, bill like 2021 bills uh, that originated in a house have to um, get out of the house of origination. Uh, so in this case, it would they have to pass out of the assembly. Um, AB 854 uh, would prevent, uh, would reform the Ellis Act so that it'll, um, it will prevent evictions um, um, of uh, rent controlled um, units from spec by speculators. Um, and AB 387 is a bill that will look into um, creating social housing, which is 
100%, which is not just affordable housing, it's actually public housing. Um, and that's a model that has been used all around the world um, very successfully. And um, Singapore has Singapore has it, um, a lot of European countries. And, um, you know, I just think that housing for how for housing, it's such a complicated issue that we need a myriad of solutions. And I think the these two bills are um, are are important. So uh, I'll I'll plug the actions in again. Thank you, Ji Jian. All righty, you guys, this was such, gosh, my head is full and I haven't even looked at the chat. It's gonna take me hours to go through the chat, I know, but thank you. You're such a wise, knowledgeable group. So uh, my head is exploding, but I've learned a lot. And I know when I read the chat, I'll learn a ton more. So thank you all of you for your contributions and to be continued. And any last parting words? All right, thank you guys. We will see you in the committees or Thursday, 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 or um, next month. And I think uh, Muriel said, I'm not allowed to say happy new year, but I'm just gonna say it one last time. Happy new year. Thank you, Lisa, you've been great. Thank, thank you, you, Lisa, thank you presenters, all of the presenters. Yeah, I don't know if Nancy, Nancy, are you still here? That was, that was enormous. That was such an undertaking. I just so admire her for doing such a deep, 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 deep dive into such a complicated topic and to presenting it to us so succinctly. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, Lisa, Night, everybody. Did, you, did you say the February meeting would likely be on the 27th? I did. Hmm. Okay. I don't remember, but there are conflicts with the 13th and the 20th. One is like a President's Day weekend or something like that. And the other one is something else. Maybe MLK Day. One's a holiday and one's... Oh, uh, uh, the 13th is the Super Bowl. Okay. So I think that's probably a deal breaker. I think, I mean, I don't care, uh, but some people okay. might care. All right. Well, just know that the 20th, on the fourth Sunday, at 6.30 is when all the neighborhood council presidents meet. I don't know how many of them are on this call or the vice president. So um, we chose that because no one else had chosen it. So now if you choose it, you know. Um, what time do you guys meet? 6.30. Oh. Or six, sorry, six o'clock. Six, how long do you guys last? Two hours. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know how many presidents are on here either, but certainly some. Uh, okay. I don't know if we can keep pushing it out. I don't know if we can push it out any further. Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to be aware of that. No, thing. thank you. Thank you. I did not know. So you guys do that the fourth Sunday of every month? Uh, well, we didn't <laughs> on the 26th of December, but yeah, generally. Yeah, generally it's fourth Sunday. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll talk to the board about it and then we'll, I don't know. Yeah, what we'll do. and, and I mean, it was chosen because we knew the, the NCSA met second Sunday and, you know, right, et cetera. So, 